sustainability meeting this Thursday evening, June 15th, 2023. I'm sorry at 6.01, but we were looking up procedural rules on whether we have a quorum or not. And um, we do have some absences that um, were requested in advance. So do we have a um, motion to excuse Vice Chair Dory Larson? Motion to excuse Vice Chair Dory Larson. I second it. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 A motion to excuse Taylor Mandalu. Motion to excuse Taylor Mandalu from tonight's meeting. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. And last but not least, Jennifer Bracy has also requested um, uh, absence for this evening, an excused absence. So do we have a motion to excuse her? Uh, yeah, I, I just I have a question because I've not yet met Jennifer. Mm -hmm. None um, of us have. Yeah, so I just, I don't know. Do you, does any? She is, is a real person. I, no, no, Robin no. Robin talked to her. <laughs> no, it is, but and I don't know that this is the appropriate <laughs> time to ask that, but, um, you know, it's been, I think, six months mm -hmm. that we've been, done excused absences, so I just don't know what the, <laughs> where we are. Do you have any information on where we are before we move forward to excuse an, another absence? Um, I did recently touch base with the clerk's office. They reached out also wanting to know about the situation further with regards to number of absences. So they're kind of uh, evaluating it by their procedures. So um, they will be getting back to me and then I'll be able to come forward with some more information probably next time. Okay. So shall we skip over that for now? And yes just to have a roll call. Okay. Thank you. Chairperson Denise Menino. Here. Vice Chairperson Dory Larson. Absence excused. Member Carol Mickett. Present. Member Taylor Mandalu. His absence has been excused. Member Karen Gallagher. Here. Member Robin Sanger mm -hmm. and Member Jennifer Bracy. So has everyone had a chance to look at the minutes from last mm -hmm. month? And are there any amendments or questions regarding the minutes? No. Can we, I don't know the procedure for this either um, because I was not here at the last meeting. I did watch the meeting, but I'm not sure. We never really found out whether somebody who was not present at the meeting can make a motion to approve or to second the motion. Is it something that can be deferred to next month? I, I did check up on that, okay. and you are allowed to okay, do that. Okay, great. Then I'll second the I, I reviewed the last month's meeting and the minutes, and I will second the motion then. No, it hasn't been made yet. I thought you made the motion to approve it. No, I didn't. Okay. That's for you to. Would you like That's to make the motion to, make to approve this, please? Yes, I make the motion to approve um, last month's minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. And we have no members from the public that I can detect. I don't know whether we have uh, Zoom access. I don't think we do. Okay, so moving on right along um, the, to the third point discussion on WSP presentation with Mike Flood on the vulnerability assessment and the project update. Is that pretty good, right? Yes. So if I'm not on Zoom, I don't need to stand in front of this, or do I need to stand in front of this? Just for the mic, it's uh, okay. they're being recorded. Yeah, okay. it's being recorded. Okay, yeah, recording. no problem. I usually like to walk around a little bit, but I'll stand here in position and <laughs> work it all out. Yeah, so uh, thanks very much for uh, your time here tonight and the ability to talk about this important project with you. And uh, as Robin said, we're working with her to help deliver this. My name, if you didn't catch it, it's actually Mike Flood, if you can believe it or not. And uh, it's not a stage name. It's actually my real name that I was born with, so. Is it F-L-O-O-D? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. 
It's so, unforgettable, that's yeah, for sure. That's right. <laughs> it's of Irish origin. I don't think they imagined the people in Florida back then, but uh, doing this type of work, but maybe. Um, so it wasn't a specialty back in Ireland to do this type of work, but obviously it's pretty important here in Florida. So, um, yeah, so that's why I'm here. So, um, yeah, so we wanted to just tell you a little bit about this project, and I think it's like uh, sustainability and resilience are obviously tied very closely together, so this is a mostly a resilience project, and really what this committee can do, you know, we're here to kind of present some information about the project, but then obviously your support when the, you know, uh, the report is written and the, and kind of the advancing some of the recommendations in the report are going to be important, so you de definitely have an important role in, the, in what comes next. This is kind of a status report, kind of tell you where we are and then what's coming next. Uh, and uh, so we're really looking forward to your participation from this point forward. Let's see. This one? This one? Oh, there we go. I had the first time. Okay, so it's just a simple outline. We're just going to talk about a few things. I put the slide deck together to make it fairly concise and uh, easy for you. So we're going to talk a little bit about the program that's paying for it. Mm -hmm. Then we'll provide a little bit about the background and then where it's heading and the prioritization approach. Okay. So first, a little bit about the program. As you know, there's a state program right now being uh, sponsored and administered by the Flor FDEP called the Florida Resilience Coastline Program. Mm -hmm. It uh, provides support to local communities to start to assess their vulnerabilities from existing and future flooding and helps uh, support their understanding of their risks to their community and then also actually provides implementation funding. So one of the, a lot of the communities now are kind of looking at things to try and see if there's a business case to be made for some level of protection or a project that's oriented around uh, flood protection. And uh, you know, one of the critical elements of this is, uh, you know, a lot of people think about sea level rise as kind of the part of climate change, which is a, a critical element, but it's tr is, which is true, but one thing to keep in mind is that comes with obviously an enhanced uh, risk from uh, storm surge, right? Mm -hmm. More water in the ocean, being affected by the same storms, driving storms farther inland and, mm -hmm. and higher as well. So definitely an, an important part of the assessment uh, is to be, able, to be able to understand that. And I also wanted to say that we have a, a nice amount of time here, so if you want to stop me at any point for questions, I think we should be okay with that, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so really the, the idea here is to get this done, to, to develop a definition of mm. what the potential risk would be and uh, to take the term climate change and turn it away from an uncertainty and an unknown and turn it into something that's a little bit more certain with good data analysis mm -hmm. and engineering. And then uh, use that to drive your policies and your decisions uh, about your community moving forward. Okay, so a little bit about the project overall. Uh, it's uh, kind of set up to do, like we talked about, the intent is to provide that definition to look at ways to determine the potential effects and of a current risk, but also the risk as they change over time. So make sure we're uh, generating something to put definition around that, some parameters around those change. Uh, look at assets that are gonna be at risk from those conditions, if they're gonna be flooded. You know, what are the risks to those assets specifically? and then find a way to identify a set of priorities for the city to put in place. Like what should be the things they should be focusing on first in terms of investments from a high level strategy position. And then really uh, one of the things that we're trying to do uh, for the city that a lot of the other uh, jurisdictions in Florida aren't really necessarily lining themselves up for is the term resilience is, a, is an opportunity in so many places right now. It's state-funded opportunity, the big infrastructure bill that uh, is being run by the, out of the federal government has a, a bunch of uh, funding available for resilience. Uh, FEMA has new programs, pre-disaster mitigation programs that allow for investments in uh, resilience. So there's just, it's just an incredible moment in time for these type of things. So basically what we're trying to do is uh, give the city, yes, of course. Um, excuse me. Um, you keep saying we're doing this. Are you part of the city? I am not. I'm sorry. As a consultant, yeah, we're working with Robin with this. Okay, so you're part of a consulting firm. That's right. WSP. Yep. Uh, okay. 
Yeah. And that stands for? That's a, it's like, uh, I have no idea actually. Uh, it's a, um, it's a uh, holding company based out of Canada uh, that uh, is a big engineering firm. It's a, I think okay. it's about 50 or 60,000 people worldwide. Are you an engineer? I'm actually a planner. You're a planner. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because I, that was confusing. Yeah, I'm me. sorry. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. I always think I'm, I'm a team person, so I always think in teams, but I should, have, I should have been a little clearer at the beginning of that. So you working with Robin. That's correct. So the city hired you to work with Robin? That's correct. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Yeah. The, ci the city was awarded one of these grants uh, through the Florida program, got the grants, and then contracted with WSP to support this, this project effort. And your job is to come up with a plan. That's correct. Our job is to basically apply good uh, science and analysis and give you, like I said, good information to help you carry you f forward into your uh, decision making and policies and investments. And do you have a deadline? Uh, we're going to finish up the summer, actually, just in a oh. few months. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Terrific. Thank the, you very much. And there's actually a uh, so one of the things about the program, the state program, is uh, they left it kind of open for the first two cycles where they said, okay, well, you can uh, come to us for funding and we'll review it. And then they said, okay, by the third year, you need to have a vulnerability assessment completed in order to be able to be eligible for funds. So the intent of this work is to get to have that completed, that this is going to meet all of the mm -hmm. criteria from that program and then be available for you to, uh, to be able to uh, go after additional funds. Okay, so we, sorry, <laughs> WSP, yeah. Did, did um, you and your team um, have, take responsibility for writing the survey that the public was given to fill out? Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, so we, you know, obviously, you know, anytime we work for any agency, it's a collaboration, right? So we come up with ideas and then your folks come back to us with edits or other ideas and then Ultimately, we put that material together to help. So anything we talk about is collaboration between city staff that we've been working with, and we're going to get to that in a little bit of more detail actually in a few minutes okay. because it's just more beneficial and it gets better buy-in and other people are kind of engaged rather than us kind of helicoptering in, dropping our analysis, and then leaving. It's, it's not as an effective way of – as a planner, I can say that if it has an engineer, I might be handicapped by that question, but <laughs> as a planner, we're all about collaboration. So are you living here? I actually live in Washington, D.C. area. Oh, so you're going back and forth. Yeah, we, ha we have a few contracts in the area. Uh, we do work for uh, Pinellas County. We have some work at the airport. We have a, we have a, we have a huge, uh, pretty big Tampa office. Oh. Uh, we have an office in Orlando, Jacksonville, Miami. We got, uh, I think we're about 2,000 people in Florida, 2,000 professionals operating in Florida right now. And you're the main guy. I'll, I'll never consider myself the main guy. I am a cog in the machine, as they say, but uh, I enjoy what I do, so. All right? Got it. Okay. So, this one's advancing. It's actually advancing on the screen, but not and on the screen. And why are these labels here? Okay. Yeah, we're going to get that in a little bit. So oh, okay. This is... Watch that. Yeah, so, the, so, so basically the, the labels were set up. What we did is we had, we kind of put together a, a, like a, a map template that we used for the first public meeting to uh, enable that. And we wanted to provide good geographic references so that people could uh, understand. Oh, here he comes right now. You can understand. <laughs> you see, you've been watching? Yeah. You, you heard me Happy. scratching my head I live, <laughs> live on television. <laughs> and... Uh, I must have pushed the wrong button. You only you didn't give me you only gave me thirty seconds of instruction. If you gave me a minute, I would have been fine. <laughs> and uh, uh, but the the idea with the labels is basically we have this map template, and you'll see it at a larger scale oh, okay. shortly. That's supposed to basically give people great orientation about their neighborhoods or city assets, so that they can, you know, have a reference on the map uh, that they can understand uh, what we're talking about here in terms of like uh, uh, certain levels of uh, of risk. And uh, 
So that so that that's basically what it is. And uh, so the idea of what we're going to run through here, I'll just tell you a little bit about what we're going to run through. So the way the project was put together is, um, it's important to understand what the flooding is or the impact, but it's also important to understand what that means to assets. Right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what one foot of flooding for one asset might be, you know, I just sweep it out and it's no problem, whereas one foot of flooding in another asset might be very problematic. It might cause damage. It might you might lose service, and then that service might be lost for the city city member. So really, what the study is about is kind of looking at things from both sides. What's the uh, what's the likelihood of certain types of flooding occurring, while at the same time understanding at some level of detail what that flooding means to the assets themselves. So for us, uh, what we're doing. So we de developed the uh, we ran the modeling for what the rainfall is going to do, the stormwater model. Mm -hmm. Look at where the rainfall is going to uh, be a potentially problematic over time in the city. And then we're leveraging some work that the University of Florida did for hmm. the entire region, where they developed, they started to look at uh, storm surge potential and sea level rise combined and how that might flow over the landscape differently with more water in, uh, in the ocean. So you're gonna mm -hmm. see here in a little bit that, that, so basically what that does is it provides like a, an analysis foundation, you know, an engineering or science mm -hmm. analysis foundation, which I said is provides definition of that future change instead of leaving all the uncertainty. You know, you want to be able to say, well, really, what could that look like? Because uh, it becomes important for anybody that's interested in, particularly in moving here, like I'm going to retire in a few years. I might want to live in Tarpon Springs. I'm going to be here for another 20 years, I'm going to say, hopefully 20 years. And uh, I did have a very rough early life. But anyway, and so if I'm going to be here for 20 years, you know, is there going to be an impact on my property? So I'm going to start looking at this information. Mm -hmm. so, and then you'll hear that in other parts of the state where uh, communities are defining, creating definition around this so that people can say, OK, well, what is this thing, climate change, what it's going to mean mm -hmm. for my community? And we can provide some strong mm -hmm. definition of what that's going to mean through these, through these tools. OK? So, uh, no luck? All right, so I'll just walk through the whole thing without the, without the deck. Okay, so, are we doing rebooting? Rebooting would be just this. Okay. Ah, there it goes. So, so one, one, one of the there. things to note is, like, uh, so we, one of, the, one of the things that we wanted to understand was, thank you. Uh, am I pushing the down button? Yep, down Too button. Too hard? Did I push it twice? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Just this, this device. Okay. Had an issue. Okay, great. So this is just a kind of a flow chart of how it comes together. Like we want to, like we said, we want to understand the hazards. That's the first part. Make sure we put some definition around the hazards. And then we want to uh, create an inventory of what those hazards potentially could do to city-owned assets. You know, your government buildings, your uh, water treatment systems, all these things. Oh. You know, what does water do with there? So you'll see that that part comes next. And then... We want to start to understand uh, how those two things could potentially come together. Like, is it likely that they're going to come together? Is it likely that they're going to come together in the near term, in the long term? You know, how do we put something around the timing of that? And then you can use that information to help prioritize, obviously. You know, if there's something is uh, likely to be flooded and also very impactful, then you want to kind of target your investments there. And then you can use that as a basis to identify your uh, priorities and your adaptation options. Are you finding that um, in the, the area of the science of climate change that there's any um, sense of what is really happening is, is predictable in any way? Because it's, it, it seems like things are, I mean, I would listen to, a, you know, on El Nino, just meteorologists talking right. about this is an El Nino year and right. whether it's going right. to help mitigate the strong tropical storms because of the way that the currents are moving. But it seems like there's a lot of unpredictable factors because we're in completely uncharted territory. Yep, that's right. So tell us about that. Yeah, so there's... There's obviously a lot of uncertainty and change, and I'm going to bring up a graph in a little bit that kind of gets to that point because mm -hmm. there's multiple projections of what the future could be. Mm -hmm. And really the best way to think about that is the timing of when it could arrive. Like mm -hmm. in terms of sea level rise, Florida's already seen 
eight or nine inches of sea level rise since the beginning of last century. So it's already occurring. And so some additional sea level rise is anticipated into the future. That's part of it. But the other part of resilience that people are starting to think about a lot is that uh, a large part of the decisions are based on FEMA data, A, because it's available, you know, it's an available resource. But then uh, the big question starts to be, well, should we be using data that's uh, intended to drive insurance for a mortgage as the foundation for our water, wastewater, government buildings? You know, there's a, there should be a different, a different way of thinking about those two things. So mm -hmm. the, the only thing I would say is that there's a lot of uncertainty even in the data that's being applied. So the, you need to, so the one thing you need to be able to put definition around is that uncertainty, but also very specifically to understand the risks and the consequences. Mm -hmm. And if you can put those two things together, then it could be a powerful decision-making framework. And as it relates to uh, the pace of change, like one foot of sea level rise could happen in 20 years, it could happen in 100 years. That's what a lot of people are saying. And people argue about how fast it's going to go and how, uh, mm -hmm. and people kind of get wrapped up in that. Well, Charleston, South Carolina has said, listen, we understand that there's so much uncertainty around there. What we're going to do as a policy is we're going to look at one foot first, and then we're going to look at two feet second, and then we're going to look at three feet third. That's the way we're going to go about doing it. Mm -hmm. We're going to take action on those things that we think are relatively near term. It could be 10, 20, 30, 40 years, but we're going to, put those into our capital plan now and then uh, figure out a way to move forward. But so there's there's much uncertainty around these uh, around this question for sure. But I want to caution it by saying that there's a lot of uncertainty and the risk and consequences too that really should be an, an element of what you're doing. So is it realistic to plan for the worst case scenario? Uh, I no. I, I mean I think it's the 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 way we the way we always think about it is if the worst case scenario destroys the town, you know, if like it's going to take out the wastewater treatment plan and everybody's going to have to move out for six right. months and everything's going to be devastated, then maybe take action on that worst case scenario. If that worst case scenario is going to hit this building and you're going to lose it for two months while they clean it up, you don't necessarily need to take action on that. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about worst case scenario, you talk about the sea level rise worst case scenario. Um, well, sea level rise in combination with stronger storms. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, I think that the key there is to understand that they're, they, they may be more likely. So if we're saying, okay, well, they may be more likely, then we should really understand what our risks are. Mm -hmm. And that's really what could, this can help you. You can say, you know, we're, really, where do our risks exist? And, uh, and then if we have a risk and it's so uncertain, we can say, hey, it doesn't, it's not reasonable to act on that. But if the certainty, if 20 years from now, it's, the certainty is more sure, and then it might make more sense to act on it at that point. And yeah. um, does WSP relate at all to, the, to um, the Florida view? I mean, the, the kind of political climate, and do you find that there's suppression of um, reality about climate change, or I mean, I think I think just I, asking. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I'm curious. I mean, cer certainly, you know, we do work in California. Mm -hmm. You know, we've done work in Hawaii. We've done work in a lot of places where uh, the perspective on this might be a little bit more uh, immediate and progressive than it could be in Florida. But I will say, you know, there's other than Cal it's it's an odd combination, but other than California, I don't know of a state that's devoting this much resources coming out of state government to pay for studies like this to help communities define this, this understanding. And I think that's obviously a recent uh, uh, concern, but it's definitely, uh, you know, it's an important one for a state agency to take on a, uh, a thing like this and say, okay, well, let's understand what our concerns are. Let's find a way to enable communities to understand our, our concerns and then figure out the, the most effective way of taking action. So did I understand you saying that we're on par with California and our concerns about what's well, happening or? I would say that the, the attention is similar, but California's got like a 10-year head start. You know, they started 15 years ago. They got so much 
climate data being generated by their academic institutions out there that you can pretty much define a anything. Mm -hmm. Wildfires, mm -hmm. flooding, landslides. You know, they're doing so much research out there that, and they've been doing that for a long time, but now that Florida is devoting a lot of resources and you got a lot of studies that are happening now. The Army Corps got work going on, NOAA's got work going on. Right. It's obviously like when we travel around the world or talk to people, we say resilience and what's the first thing somebody says? Florida, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it is you, for surrounded you, by water. You, yeah, you guys are the <laughs> kind of the epicenter of everything. You know, the every storm, like you can stand on Miami and look southeast, and every storm that's generated in the Atlantic starts there mm -hmm. and starts heading up in this direction somewhere. So certainly, and then we've also been involved in um, other things with like. Uh, state agencies and the Florida emergency management folks from both transportation and mm -hmm. and they just go in and, and they say, well, what's your problem? We've already solved it 10 times, you know, because we're so used to these type of things in Florida that we can actually advise you, Maryland or Virginia or New Jersey, who don't really get these things all that often, how to set up your contracting, how to get handle debris, how to handle uh, evacuations planning in a better way. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely... Uh, collaboration. So certainly there's other states in front of you in terms of like having expended more time, but you're definitely catching up very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it really, really like the key for this is this, this study is going to be done and then where it goes from here is going to be up to mm -hmm. you guys and the, you know, the, the, the leadership from within the city, are you going to push forward into uh, different, different decision making or ask for priorities? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay, so this so this basically identifies that, you know, this isn't WSB coming in. We actually worked a lot with city staff to understand the risk to their assets. We said, okay, you know, if a foot of water came into your facility, what would happen? If two feet of water came in, what would happen? If three feet came in, what would happen? Is it devastating? Is it electrical systems, which are important? Is it just a little bit of damage? So we had we had a uh, entire process of defining that. We have that available in spatial data to help drive the decision making. And then this is basically kind of a, a when, we're, when we're talking to the city assets, as I said, we want to look at these thresholds where the impacts potentially could occur, and then look not only at the cost of the building itself, but how does that filter out into the city? You know, is it an important element, for, as we said, for wastewater, for water supply, for uh, social services for education. You know, we want to understand the definition of that asset more than what's the, fl you know, what's the flooding doing to it. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we spent some time with your folks to help drive this definition. We'll get to why in, in a little bit. So uh, the next part, as I said, we kind of developed this understanding of flooding. And this is where I talked about, this is, uh, these are two of uh, five or six estimates for sea level rise that are out there, and these are the two that are identified for uh, for the FDEP calculations, and you can see this is the feet of sea level rise, and that's the end of the century, and you can see kind of the low one, the intermediate low, these are estimates established by NOAA. Intermediate low says there's going to be around just, just less than two feet of sea level rise by the end of the century, or if the emissions remain high and the melts remain high and all those things uh, continue on a high track, then you can anticipate about six feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. And this is Clearwater Beach, so how does that translate for tarpon? Yeah, this is actually a Clearwater Beach gauge. So NOAA has a bunch of offshore gauges. Oh, yes, they do. They've been basically monitoring right. uh, tide, tide levels over time, so this is one of the closest gauges yeah. that we can pull from and see what's, what's a relative uh, change here in Clearwater. Mm -hmm. So that's what that is. So this kind of gets to your question of uncertainty. Like how, how certain are we about this question? As I said, it drives, it mostly can drive policies like, okay, we, we know we're gonna, when are we gonna get this one foot of sea level rise? Well, from these two conditions, we can say sometime between, right before 2040, 2030 mm -hmm. to 2040, or beyond 2060. Yeah. So and then there's surprises. Like in California, I mean, they were dealing with a wildfire issue every summer. I know my sister lives right in Redding, California, where an oh, yeah. entire town was burnt to the ground. And now 
um, a, a whole new phenomenon that I'd never even heard of before the last couple of years, atmospheric rivers. Mm -hmm. So the Earth itself seems to have mechanisms or s surprises that kick in to protect. Right. You know, and I, I don't know. Uh, it just seems really um, interesting, you know, to be a, here witnessing yeah. mm -hmm. these well, things right now. Well, the, I mean, the, the, the general assumption that is that the planet is warming and a warmer atmosphere and warmer conditions drive a lot of those things. Like, mm -hmm. atmospheric rivers require warm water and, and uh, same thing with wildfires. You know, they kind of require these conditions and those conditions are showing up more regularly so you would anticipate that extreme events are going to happen more more regularly. Mm -hmm. And that's really one of the things is, okay, if we can anticipate, if, if an extreme event happened here in Tarpon Springs, what would happen? Mm -hmm. Like, what, what damage would it do? And we, you should be able to understand that to be able to say, well, is it, you know, we could clean up quickly or it would, you know, it would devastate our economy or it devastate our thing. And when you say extreme uh -huh. thing, you're meaning flooding. Yeah, like a hurricane, something like that. Heavy so not when you're focusing on the water? Yeah, I mean, that's in Florida, that's probably the most damaging. And like California, we've looked at kind of. Well, wind is really yeah, bad. Yeah, it can be, yeah, during a hurricane yeah. condition, right? I mean, when we've had Irma, we had like 12 trees down in our yard. Right. We don't get any water. Right. Was there we any. We're next to a bayou, yeah. and we're not in a flood zone. But if Ian had hit us directly, as was. Mm -hmm. Potential right. last time. That's you right. just dodged this m major bullet. That's right. It could have been really. It could have been. That's what it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. This is why FEMA data. Right. Like I live on the water. Yeah, interesting. Beautiful. And I'm in flood zone X. Ah. I don't have to. I get flood insurance because you know, in case of something. Ah. But I'm not in the flood zone. Ah. Are you on that bayou? I was just at a at a coffee shop. Was it Copenhagen Coffee Shop or something? Up on the main no, street? No, Spring Bay. No, okay. I'm on. Okay. Um, Karen's on Spring Bay. <laughs> oh, Are you on Spring Bay? Beautiful over there. Whoever lives there, very nice place. Mm -hmm. So one day I hope to be able to live in a place like that. That's my long-term mm -hmm. goal. Not in 2100. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, I hope you get there before like, that. <laughs> like we, we've done work at, at Florida Keys before, right? We've done work in Monroe County. We helped them develop their plan for elevating their roads and for me that people are like would you move there i said yeah you know i have like you know say maybe two three decades left and yeah. based on my analysis of the data sure i think i feel comfortable moving there and that's really what data is supposed to do it's supposed to help you make decisions without that it's just like one big question right if i can move down there if i could afford it so anyway so you, what you see here is you're going to see uh just an overview of some of the analysis so as we said, in the analysis, we created these data points. We've created this understanding of what flooding may look like. So the first one is obviously precipitation-based flooding and precipitation-based flooding for certain uh, rainfall types. So here you'll see that the results of the stormwater modeling for uh, a 25-year, you know, like a heavy, pretty heavy rainfall in uh, over a, a day, you know, what would be flooded. And, and then you can see on the left, which is kind of the more important part, you don't want to just understand where the flooding is. You want to have a good feeling of how deep the water is so that you can use that to make uh, more effective decisions. And one of the things to note as it relates to stormwater flooding is that uh, an elevated uh, tidal condition, basically what sea level rise, can make stormwater flooding worse for two, for two reasons, one of which is uh, see, sea level rise comes with a, a, a potentially uh, equal increase in groundwater conditions, and then therefore you've lost the capacity of the ground to be able to take some of that water in, and then you it's also starting to affect things like your stormwater outfalls. Like your stormwater outfalls are starting to get clogged. The, the stormwater systems are no longer going to be functional, and that's really one of the key things. Is So let's say if we said to you, okay, we can identify for you all of your stormwater outfalls that are six inch above current tide. That would be a good thing to think about because those areas potentially are going to be flooded. Hopefully not the two bayous, but 
somewhere it might be flooded, so then you might want to take effect of that. Yeah. yeah. This thing, Tarpon Bayou Center, uh -huh. what is that? Because that's the little peninsula on which I live. I don't know any tar what Tarpon Bayou Center is. Oh, Tarpon Bayou Center. Because um, that's, the, that's the Chesapeake uh, little peninsula. Tell me, it's residential. It's beautiful to me. I'll find out and uh, <laughs> check with the Cooktar group and get back to Cook and maybe we can try to put that on the check. I would wonder if that's the assisted living facility that's on the road. Oh, that could be. Oh, is that it? I think yeah. it is. These are mostly city owned. Uh, but that's not city owned. A lot of these are community owned, like the SPC camp, the college yeah. campuses, the hospital. I don't know what Tarpon Bayou is. On here currently, there's a mix. It's not of called Tarpon Bayou. So. Okay. Well, anyway, I want to know what's we'll going it it. it. no Maybe it's my house. Okay. <laughs> These things. Okay, so the, then the other question is what happens with uh, sea level rise? So this is current. Uh, Mean higher high water, which is the highest tide, you guys probably have heard that condition before. Uh -huh. Mean higher high water is basically high tide conditions. So what does high tide look like? So these should be the areas that you see flooded on a regular basis in high tide, mm -hmm. uh, currently, or mm -hmm. close to something like this, given the oh. data types that we have. Mm -hmm. And then right. how does that change over time? So we're going to follow that. This is following that higher curve. So this is basically getting the six feet of uh, sea level rise. And you'll see how it kind of changes over time. So you'll see in uh, oh. by, by 2040, you get other areas that are kind of inundated during that mean high, high water condition. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you'll note, and I actually observed it in uh, one of the fingers in McGraw County, is that there was, a, there was a community down there and they had an intersection that flowed. Uh, and it was right off the edge of the intersection. And it, it flooded for part of the day and then it wasn't flooded for part of the day. It wasn't connected to the waterway. It was basically just coming up and going down and coming up and going down. And that's what you'll see in here is that there's there's low areas that could be assumed to be flooded in the future and we wanted to identify for those. And then as you go a little farther out, so you're following that out to 170, which I think is about probably three or four uh -huh. feet of uh, sea level rise, you can see those areas and then again key part is what is it what's the depth of flooding at those areas uh -huh. and then again by 2100 with that six feet of sea level rise as you said probably the bayous uh, uh, are going to be flooded areas if you're close to the water with six feet of sea level rise obviously and then uh, so that's the kind of what sea level rise looks like in the city so it's again providing some definition to help uh, homeowners and decision makers kind of have this information but tarpon does have areas um, where it comes up through the storm drains and floods. Yeah. yeah. Like if you try to get to my house from the sponge docks, you gotta like detour all around or you or you're going through salt water pretty deep. Yeah. Well one one of the things that other communities have started to do for things like that is they've kind of created uh, an online system where you can go in and say my my street is flooded or my area is flooded today and then you can kind of match that up with the rationale for why. And uh, so that's something that Pinellas County, they started their program like six or seven years ago and they're trying to put it together now to, in order to be able to enable like a reporting. Well, trip. Tarpon knows where they all are because they quickly put up barricades and okay. signs to tell great. you not to come this way. Great, great. Okay, so then what, is, uh, what does storm surge look like? Okay, so this is, you guys are aware of FEMA, this is basically a representation of FEMA's 100 year floodplain. Wow. Over the, over the thing, you can see there's quite a few uh, mm. areas of the city that could be flooded. Yeah. The key part is that part over there on the left, which is basically what's the depth of flooding. You know, if it's a few inches of flooding, uh, no big deal. Mm -hmm. And if it's, but if it's more significant right. flooding, then mm -hmm. that's obviously problematic. Again, mm -hmm. following that same curve mm -hmm. up into the future, you can see how the, that, those values kind of shift upwards terms of both extent and depth uh, associated with that, uh, with the sea level rise and the increase in storm surge. So again, the intent of this is just to provide that level of data definition. And uh, in uh, Pinellas County, I think they actually took this data that was generated by the University of Florida that's part of their flooding, flooding ordinances now uh, to, 
to apply this data for can, for decision. Yep. Sorry, can you just define? Uh, sorry, this is going to sound really ignorant on this part, but can, thank you, I appreciate that. Can you define the difference when you say storm surge with the hundred year depth? Mm -hmm. Right now, like when we talked about Ian coming through mm -hmm. and possibly hitting Tarpon Springs, they were warning about a 15 foot storm surge right. coming through. And so right now we look at that and we say in, in the hundred year or the 2100, um, you're looking at that storm surge as 10 feet to 15 feet. What's the difference there? Yeah. Is so, you explain that? Yeah, the, so the way that uh, FEMA works is they, they work off like statistical analysis. They kind of created the structure and what they do is they, uh, the way they actually build it is they look at all the storms that have been in your region and then it gets an analyst to adjust those storms in terms of like mm -hmm. track and air pressure and then they build this entire suite of data points of flooding and then they actually run a statistical analysis on that to say what's a, and the 100 year flood is basically uh, a 1% annual chance. Like, what's like a low probability of occurring, that's what a 100 year event is intended to be. So it's really mostly like a statistical analysis of flooding. What you're talking about is basically you know the track, you know the information about the storm, and what can we expect in our community. And the same University of Florida folks, uh, uh, Peter Sheng and Scott Vladimir, they actually have that too. They can basically model the track of the storm and tell you in advance which area that you can anticipate to be now what, what this is, the reason people use this is, uh, is you know, as I said, it's kind of a foundation that everybody's aware of. So it's like, uh, you know, we can kind of look at how this thing is going to change. It's an important element of insurance. I don't know if you mm -hmm. guys are, uh, you don't have insurance, but there's a lot of people uh, struggling with what's called risk rating 2.0 right now, which is kind of a new FEMA. Uh, well, I, I have it. I'm just it. not supposed to need it. Yeah. And, uh, it's not called. And so, so there's some level of understanding. And the other thing it does is the, the federal government lets you <coughs> establish a way to identify the financial value of risk. Mm -hmm. And so they use these statistical probabilities to say, okay, the city's facing $75 million in potential risk by this, by this data. So that's, that's why it's important to have it. So you can use that later when you're uh, going for additional funds. It's a very complex process and I've tried uh, many, many times to explain the whole thing to people, and I've never actually done it effectively. And I'm not, not sure I understand it all myself, which is part of the problem. But it's basically a, an entire framework that lets you support investments in mm. the future, which is the reason that uh, we felt like together, Robin and I felt like it was important for the for the city to have this foundation from the beginning. So it would be helpful, at least to me, yeah, to have this map. And then have it without all the signs on yeah, it, yeah. because I can't see yeah. the map. Yeah. And this this helps me to say, okay, I got it. I'm oriented. I know where it is. But just let me see the map. Yeah. So if you could have both of those things. Yeah, we'll remove it from the next one for sure. And, and actually, the map, the basis of the map was using the first public meeting because we didn't have any flood. And hmm. It just basically shows those areas. Right. So, but I agree that it's too much clutter over yeah. the front. It's okay. covering up the map, yeah. so and you can't see the yeah. the results you're trying to show. Right. We had a discussion. Rob was on this discussion with our technical team where we talked about this mm -hmm. already. So, in the, in the future products and certainly in the plan, that level of, of yeah. labeling and detail will not be there. All right. So, again, the idea here is just let's define, let's put definition around this future conditions so we can make better and more effective decisions, all right? Mm -hmm. So basically, what do we do with that? As I said, uh, so we have the, oh, so basically what you do is, uh, like we talked about, so we can say, oh, that's not it, uh, oh, let's see, down is forward, I think, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what we're working towards is, like, so we, so we can say, okay, there's areas of the city by this analysis, they're going to be flooded more often. Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be areas that are going to be flooded far less often, right? Uh, and then there's assets that could potentially be very impacted, and there's assets that aren't going to really have any impact. So if we think about all of that as an information envelope, really what we want to focus our attention on, 
likely flooding, significant impact, right? Mm -hmm. You would want to kind of understand that to be able to, to drive policy, and you'll see that that's what this is basically built on. So with those, with all that flooding data that we just showed you, we have these, you know, like, is it likely, to, you know, more likely or less likely to flood, and the depth of flooding, and then you can see the impacts. And so basically, a, a, a basic structure of decision making would be to say, you can see high probability events and high impact events, which is that bottom right corner, we're gonna focus our attention on. High, high probability events with moderate impact are still gonna be important for us. Medium probability with high impact are still gonna be important to us. Those, that's where we're gonna focus our attention. That's where we really wanna say, hey, as a city, we want those assets to be well-defined and potentially be part of our strategy so that we can drive that forward. And then we, if we uh, have impetus and can get enough funding or there's something else involved in those yellow ones, you know, like it's an important cultural thing mm -hmm. or it's an important uh, part of the community, then we can maybe put our, you know, like say that those are also our priority or maybe shift through the priorities, but really start to think about those two things, which is the science-based analysis that the city is going to be able to do with all this data that we've put together for you, mm -hmm. right? And it, it's, for example, where I live, um, most people who live on this little peninsula yeah. aren't going to flood. Right. But you can't, we won't be able to get in and out right. because on the road that we access is always flooded. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're all going to be stranded. We'll be dry, but I guess people have boats so they can yeah. get so, out. Interestingly, we were doing some work in Hawaii, and I, if I don't, if you guys have been to Hawaii, if you haven't been to Hawaii, it's basically two volcanoes with a road around it, right? Yeah. That's basically what most of Hawaii is, and uh, so there's nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. You know, the road is basically between the volcano and the sea, and right. in order to be able to move that road, you have to take it up. 50 mm -hmm. feet and carve a part of the uh, volcano out. So the head of uh, the transportation department of Hawaii said, listen, we're going to support this system until we can't support it anymore, and then you're going to have to find your way. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, get ready for a boat, get ready for some other way to get around. Or if your entire community could be underwater, then we're not going to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Other areas like in, um, mm. in uh, Florida Keys, they're saying, hey, uh, the the, the um, properties are high enough, but the roads are too low. Right. So what we want to do is we want to invest in elevating roads so that they're not flooded so often so that people can get in and out without hmm. a problem. So they've invested a lot of their resources and uh, have been able to get grant funding to pay for elevating hmm. roadways to uh, provide that service through. Uh, through That's a good area. idea. Yeah. Right? So almost, almost the end. This is actually my last slide. So... So basically, once we have that together, then we'll be able to identify priority areas, like what are those areas that seem to be flooded that have a bunch of clustered assets. We want to start thinking about uh, protected strategies. And you'll see here, uh, I put this just a little graph that the Army Corps has a series of these kind of uh, images that kind of show how things could be adjusted over time. So if you have a coastal area and it's exposed to open water flooding and that comes with big waves. Mm. Can we put a structure out in the water? You know, like a, we call that dam infrastructure, right. like a berm and maybe some wetlands and that'll basically knock mm -hmm. down the waves so then only what comes ashore is the, the surge without the wave on top of that big structured wave. So there's a bunch of strategies that could potentially put in place. Mm -hmm. So when we get to the planning uh, uh, exercise, we're gonna identify those mm -hmm. areas and those strategies that could be put in place to help mm. uh, address Concerns at a conceptual level, obviously not an engineering level, and then uh, hold it. We're basically going to put all this information together. We're having an outreach meeting. I'm supposed to have that on the slide. Do you have that date? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be July 10th at Craig Park Recreation Center from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Sure. And we'll have a flyer soon for this. It's going to be July 10th at the Craig Park Recreation Center from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock p.m. Is that the one that has the mural on it, the rec center? Yes. 
then, you know, again, the, the, the intent is to get the plan done this summer because the city's actually applying for additional funding and yeah. having the plan be completed uh, will help uh, help with your application. So, so that's a Monday. That's right. It is. Okay. What time of day is that? Yeah. Evening, okay. 6 p.m. So there's been another plan kind of in motion that we were supposed to get updated on Arcadis um, project for the Whitcomb Bayou, and they were, you know, looking at a lot of different ways to kind of divert water. But, you know, to my mind, if you divert it away from where it's currently flooding, and it was actually flooded there this morning. The signs were up. I was mm -hmm. driving through there, and it was really high water. Um, they... Um, you know, there's ne never been any mention of anything like a levee that could maybe be in the river, mm -hmm. you know, in the and cloat to prevent the water from even mm -hmm. moving into that area, which seems like, I mean, if we're going to look at the worst case scenario, why not look at the best option For sure. right up front yeah. and not spend a lot of money for these band-aids in the right. interim. That's right. Yeah, so in New York and in Miami, they're talking about that idea where you basically put a, mm -hmm. like a, a, a series of structures offshore, like a protective envelope around the city that doesn't make you have to adjust every building, every neighborhood, every street corner, so there's kind of a broader strategy for that. They're obviously, in those areas, they're tremendously expensive, right, to, yeah. to build something like that, you know, almost like a, Amsterdam type of situation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but definitely, you, uh, those are things to think about. But the, I think the key is to understand where your risks are, and then figure out what your strategies would be, and then see what type of uh, appetite the various, uh, uh, you know, the various funding sources. And we actually have an entire uh, team that was bought last year that just focuses on uh, funding strategies, like uh, what could you get from grants, what you could get through green mm -hmm. bonds, what you could get through all these other things mm -hmm. to put together a funding strategy once you identify your plan. So our bayou, Kramer Bayou, which feeds into the Anclote, mm -hmm. we have a whole series of mangrove islands. Yeah. So Great. they are Very protective. really protective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have to go, there's a channel, but right next to it are mm -hmm. this whole mangrove yeah. area, a whole bunch of them. So that can really help protect. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I thought you were going to say something differently at the beginning, which is actually something else we saw in um, in one of the neighborhoods in Monroe, where there was a road, and it basically, uh, you know, Monroe is just basically a highway with roads that go out east and west, and it was a western uh, a neighborhood that went out to the west, and you guys went and bulldozed this area, put this big community, and the farther you get out to the end, obviously the houses get more and more expensive, right? Because mm -hmm. the ones on the end are overlooking the water. And they, they had a roadway that was going underwater fairly often, just like that. Well, the last five houses got together and elevated their roadway. So mm -hmm. they basically said, okay, well, if we should elevate it a foot or 12 or 14 inches to keep right. the localized flooding out of our area. Well, what actually happened is the uh -huh. downstream of that whether it's true or not, and it's probably not true because if it's tidal water, it just comes through an elevation and fills one in. But all the rest of the people said, you've made our condition worse. Yeah. But what, what you've done, you've actually spread that flooding out to the rest of our community by what you've done. So you've got to be a little bit careful about those yeah, yeah. strategies, try to think a little bit more community-wide. So, so basically what the, the county is doing is they're elevating that entire roadway mm -hmm. and putting in actually a stormwater uh, a new stormwater system because the storm, you know, it'll be ineffective with, with the elevated roadway. Mm -hmm. So in areas that are elevated fairly regularly, particularly in like uh, in your historic area or in the cities, the stormwater controls right. and pumps and systems, there's a lot of people that uh, uh, have funding available for those type of improvements right now. That's what I said. In, in terms of like uh, availability from the state and federal agencies right now is the time, the time you want to mm -hmm. define it, if you do want to take action to identify those strategies and see what type of money you can get. It's mm -hmm. an extraordinary moment in time for yeah. residents right now. It's mm -hmm. fabulous. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. That's it. Any, That's any other it. questions? 
Thank you. Um, Karen, do you have any no, thank other you very questions? Much. Appreciate it. Yeah, sure thank you for the presentation, Absolutely. the conversation, Absolutely. and all the great info. Yeah, anytime. Look forward to seeing you all at the public meeting. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank thanks you. very much. See you, uh, <laughs> see you next time. I'm going to go. Oh, I was asking. I know the history of the town, so I'm going to go find a good Greek restaurant on my way out. So. <laughs> <laughs> I ate at the Copenhagen place for, for coffee. So. Go to Katarina's. Is that right? Oh, yeah. I, mean, I had lunch there. They're terrific. It's on Alt 19. Okay. And it's um, if you go out Pine, it's almost right across the street. Okay. And you can sit outside. It's oh, nice. really cute and okay. it's fabulous. All right, I'm going there next. If you guys have any follow-up questions, just give me a call over there. <laughs> All, right. Do All right, Mr. Flood. Karen, okay, thank you, Mike. Do you... Are you able to get out from your street? Mm -hmm. You don't have flooding there. Uh, I think twice in the time that I've lived there over the past 11 years, we've had, but they were significant storms. I mean like on your street? At the end of my street. Yeah. But Spring Bayou used to flood all the time. Mm. On the road near Spring Bayou used to flood. Our next discussion <laughs> on the agenda is Earth Day debrief, which we missed hearing about last month because Robin wasn't with us. But she is now. Yes. Just making sure you took his flash drive. Mm. Uh, I thought I saw him reaching for something there. So. Okay. Well, Otherwise, I'll be mailing it to DC, I guess. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Just trying to pull things back up on the screen. <laughs> oh, drag okay. it over and drop it at the top. And I should have known that one. And you got the sidebar there to scroll down. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, so for a little Earth Day debrief, um, as you know, we had our Earth Day event on the actual Earth Day. April 22nd at the library. It was a great event. We had several city departments in attendance. Um, so off the top of my head, we had our water, we had our wastewater and our water division. Of course, our sustainability, Alex and myself had a booth. Um, we also had our sanitation department there as well. Um, and recreation department was there. Um, and then also the Grow Group, which is kind of a part of recreation, um, does a great community service, which I think most of you are probably aware of the Grow Group. Um, so they were there as well. Uh, in addition to that, we had several community partners, mm -hmm. and that was great to be able to engage with more of our community and bring those local organizations into the event. So we had Pete's for Tarpon, we had um, specifically Robin Sanger there in attendance. Mm -hmm. uh, we had Dory come and represent Southern Alliance for Clean Energy and she did uh, one of her EV ride and drive events and Denise helped out at her booth and uh, helped uh, talk to the um, residents who came up to discuss what her organization does. And then I think Dory mentioned she had about six people do ride and drives. So that was some good exposure, I'd say. I don't know how many she normally gets. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you'll ask her next time. Uh, in addition to that, we also had the Girl Scouts. We had the Garden Club of Tarpon Springs. Uh, we had, um, again, the Grow Group. The library was there. Oh, yeah, the library was there. That's the other city department that I was It was getting. at the Should library. Have had the list. <laughs> Should have had the list in front of me. Yeah, we were at the library. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, Alex, do you remember any KPB? other? Yes, thank you. Keep Pinellas Beautiful mm. was there as well. Uh, and we also had uh, something cool for this event. We uh, worked with a local vendor, Auburn Supply Group, and uh, they provide this service for several other local municipalities who have um, sustainable procurement guidelines in place and try to do low waste events. They work with the Auburn Supply Group because they're a local company that has um, sustainable products mm -hmm. for events and um, certified compostable products. So we purchased for this event all of our utensils, our plates, our cups, uh, napkins, that sort of thing from Auburn Supply Group. They were certified compostable. Mm -hmm. And we hired um, Suncoast Compost, the company, to come to the event and bring their compost bins. And they had tons of bins all throughout mm -hmm. the event. For about every trash can, there was a, a little Suncoast compost bin. And their staff was great and very attentive and there for the whole event, talking to people and um, getting you know, people more aware about composting. And so pretty much all of our food was compostable, all of our utensils, all of our plates, everything. So it was a low waste event. Um, and then that which could not be composted could be recycled. So we had you know, some cans of soda that were actually left over from another recreation event and chips and that sort of thing um, that were set to expire soon. So we used them for this event mm -hmm. and we had our recycling bin. So there's no food waste there and we um, made up for it with the recycling component. And also we did a TerraCycle for uh, Capri Suns. So we had some Capri Suns. Can't recycle those, but our, our recreation team, they did the TerraCycle, if you all are familiar, and showed initiative there to try to cut back on the waste. Um, and so we estimated from the amount of compost collected, um, the company estimated we had about 225 participants mm. to the event, which is very good, and about four times the amount we had at last year's event. Uh, of course, this event was much larger in scale as well, um, because last year we had, I think we had about three departments in attendance, and we did not involve community partners, and it was a smaller scale event at the library, and we had about 56 attendees, so this one we had 225 or so. <laughs> so overall, the event was well attended and well received and heard good things from the community members. Alex, do you have anything you want to add? You don't, no, <laughs> you don't much have coveted. to, but... Pretty much coveted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what I have on my side, but I know several of you attended as well. Love to hear your thoughts on how it went. Oh, I thought that it was a very festive and positive experience throughout the whole time. I w was there at, towards the end, and but one of the things I really liked was that they're, they were giving all the stuff away, and you know, like the basil seeds, and, the, and, and I thought that was terrific. And so mine are all planted. Is oh, it coming yeah. out cooking? So, I mean, I think that that is a really good way that engages people mm -hmm. after the event. Yeah. And absolutely. it's easy. Yeah, that's a good point. We tried to do like sustainable giveaways, yeah. like most departments did either seeds mm -hmm. or we gave uh, like re the reusable bags with our. Right, logo really on nice. them. Yeah. Um, and then we had a few activities like our wastewater. They had to like make a bird feeder. Um, Girl Scouts had some sort of a cool activity. I, I didn't, it was like a seed bomb or something like that, they called it. Hmm. Yeah, it was with peanut butter or something, and they rolled it in seeds for birds. Hmm. Oh, I, I yeah. think that was maybe that, maybe that's what it was. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't get a chance to do it myself. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, and then we also had a, an inflatable slide and a DJ, and uh, all the food was free, and we had vegan options for the food. So, yeah. Well, so can't wait till next that. year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now we have a um, good momentum going, I think, for yeah. our Earth Day. Now, do you want to um, keep going on uh, the knowledge and nibbles sure. debrief? Sure. Um, so our Knowledge and Nibbles series has concluded. Uh, as you know, we started it in February, and it ended in May. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had total four presentations, one a month, and we had different guest speakers come in. Um, we had speakers. The first one was done by um, speakers from UF. IFAS Pinellas mm-hmm. County Extension, and they talked about Florida friendly practices. And we had Keep Pinellas Beautiful talking about microplastics. We had um, the Southwest Florida Water Management District talking about water conservation. And then lastly, I gave a presentation on the city's sustainability initiatives. And thank you to the committee members for attending so many of these events. Mm-hmm. That's great. Um, We had variable attendance uh, depending on the topic and the day, and we also realized kind of after it was already set in stone with our dates that it was um, maybe overlapping with uh, the Sunset Beach concert series, Mm. two of the events. So may or may not have impacted attendance for two of the four events um, because those two events were our two lowest attendance events that interlap, so that overlapped. So now we know for the future to maybe do a little bit, making sure that it doesn't overlap with any other city events before scheduling. But overall, we had pretty good attendance for our first in the series with UF IFAS extension. We had about 30 or so um, attendees. That was our largest. I think people were really excited about that topic about um, the Florida friendly landscaping practices and at our second we had around 13 I want to say participants um, to our microplastics uh, presentation to our third from Swift Mud we had around six or so Hmm. Um, and then to our final one we had around I want to say 15 to 20 somewhere in that range and at all of our events, we provided refreshments, some food, some beverage, allowed time for community members to come and mingle at the beginning and at the end. And most of the presenters tried to make it interactive. They all gave time for questions and um, I thought did a great job. We're very attentive um, speakers. And um, I received some good positive feedback from the community and also some good community feedback in general from listening and just being an observer and hearing what the community thought in response to each lecture. So I think it was a success overall. Is there a future for this to continue next season or what what are the options to interact with the public about sustainability? That is something um, I think we're still determining. So Knowledge and Nibbles is Tarpon Arts event. Mm -hmm. Uh, They put it on every year, and they kind of determine the host every year. So they had actually reached out to me and asked me to host it this this year. And they try to alternate their host and their theme every year. So the previous year it was Shannon Brewer, our Mm -hmm. municipal arborist, and it was all about trees and our tree program and this year it was all about our sustainability program Uh, but I did reach out to them thank them for the opportunity let them know we'd really love to do it again so we'll see we'll see what they have in mind but um, definitely told them we'd love to continue working with Tarpon Arts in the future for events and um, we put in our budget request money for promotional activities to continue doing educational programming so definitely intend to do that not sure exactly at this point what it will be what it will look like but um, I'll definitely keep you updated 
If um, they al allow us to do something again that's TARP and ARTS, it would be wonderful to actually have um, some conversation on how art does bring awareness to sustainability. And that would be your wheelhouse, probably. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, so we've that's a great thing got a lot of. Could do that. Yeah. yeah, I think that it's wonderful for the departments to kind of integrate and interweave um, our values and, and goals and perspectives together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, I've spoken to you about this. Um, so um, it seemed to me, given that we did that um, session, the first one on alternative landscaping with um, that. It's Florida friendly. Yeah, Florida friendly. Yeah. That the city, my assumption was the city was following that. And I've spoken to Robin that in my, on my neighborhood, there's a little park and they've just installed sprinklers. It was just sand, you know, it's a Florida park, right? It had oak trees and filled with sand. And so they installed um, sprinklers and put sod in it, the whole thing. And I mean, it, the sod got like giant. Now they they mowed it. Now it's giant again, and a lot of it's turning brown. So, I'm like, and there was no consulting of the neighborhood. Nobody in the neighborhood wanted that. Um, and along Pinellas Trail, for example, they've, mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's the city or the county, because the trail's the county, but I thought the land was the city. They've put in those yellow popcorn you know, is it peanut? The peanuts yeah, thing. Something. And yeah. those you don't mow. Right. Like, they're going to have to come and mow this park like every week. I mean, it's high. If you don't, there'll be critters all in it. So it's certainly not, uh, you know, something that is sustainable or good for our environment. So it seemed like we did this lecture. You know, and it's like we're promoting it to the, the citizens, and yet the city doesn't seem to be following it, where it would have been appropriate to, would have been a good thing to do if they wanted to put anything in it. Because no one uses the park except it, me. A, an opportunity for a demonstration. Exactly. Of sustainable landscape. Right. Perhaps you know I was at the um, I was at the Splash Park on Sunday and I mm -hmm. you know I go there just to to launch my paddleboard and there's there, it's green but I you know was kind of got down and looked at it but it's not grass it's some sort of ground cover that just mm -hmm. seems to stay stay green I don't know I didn't notice sprinklers there but I always you know, lay my board out there when I'm deflating and, and just um, wipe it off. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's protective, but I was looking at it and I was thinking, oh, I wonder what this is because this would be great for our easement in front of the house because our easement is just generally weeds and, you know, torpedo grass and it's not very pretty, but that looked good. But, I, you know, I hear what Carol's saying is that there's, um, it would be nice and I, and I see that this happens in a lot of cities where there's a lack of coordination between mm -hmm. um, departments on what the priorities or what the um, vision is. You know, and if we have a vision, an overarching vision um, for even our comprehensive plan to be more sustainable, we need to relate to one another about what's happening on properties and, and get some opinions and feedback, but I, what would the process be to initiate this? Maybe even from us asking that question of um, whoever's responsible. Can we have a discussion before just moving ahead on something that might not fit into the grand scheme of the city's goals to be more sustainable? Uh -huh. it must be parks. I mean, it's a park. Yeah, I'm still investigating that situation. Um, so far, I've been unable to figure out who exactly 
was responsible. So I'm still working on that. And it's different um, sort of grass. There was some uncertainty as to whether that was a city-owned parcel or not. So oh, it's city-owned. I'm going to I'm going to get to the bottom of that. Uh, but we do have good news in our sustainability plan, several yeah. actions related to that. And that's kind of where we'll start to, like you said, set the vision. Mm -hmm. We have actions that specifically set that standard for uh, Florida-friendly landscaping and adopting that in our land development code and ordinances. And, and also to engage the neighborhood. I mean, the neighbors were like, did you see this? I mean, they're like, the neighbors are all crazy, you know, angry about it. I saw it and I thought, what? You know, and the, so there was no engagement of the neighborhood. And so, and wasted resources. So it does give, as Denise said, it could have been an opportunity to engage the neighborhood and show that there are alternatives and a lot of us in the neighborhood, exactly what you're saying about the easement, mm -hmm. want to find something other than grass to put there. Especially in a drought year. Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So we'll look forward to the yes. update. Yes, yeah. we do. Yeah. So now, can we move to um, the timeline for the sustainability plan? Alex, would you like to do this one? Do you usually do this one? <laughs> sure, not a problem. <laughs> so as, as everyone can see, we have finished our third and final draft of the sustainability plan. And yeah, I know, right, exciting times. And so we're getting ready to present this uh, final plan to the BOC um, sometime in late June, I would imagine. Um, but we have everything set up for it, and uh, I think we made all the relevant changes, and so we're just prepping the final presentation right now. What's that going to be? Uh, so from there, um, we're aiming for end of June, possibly early July. So we do we do have a date set for this. Um, okay. It's going to be the June twenty seventh Board of Commissioners meeting. June twenty seventh. June 27th. Say? And do um, uh -huh. you have any idea um, what, what, where it's going to be in the agenda? They, last time I saw, were still considering between presentations or special consent, so I'm not sure mm -hmm. yet. I think they were also looking at potentially starting that meeting early at 6 instead of 6.30 because it was such a robust agenda. Um, so I will give a status update to the committee via email prior to. Okay, thank you. Sure. Never a good day for me. So I think if anyone's able to go, it would be yeah. fun and rewarding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have a conflict, I'll see. But they will love it. They will. They'll be impressed with all the work and it's so clear and it's visually promising, mm -hmm. so. They'll be blown away. They'll be blown Thank away. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Okay. So items for the next meeting, agenda. <clears throat> we do have a couple things. Um, Arcadis couldn't make it today, uh, they had to delay by a month, so they'd like to be in our July meeting to do that update right. for Whitcomb Bayou. Um, additionally, Shannon, oh, Shannon's Tree Workshop is actually, she'd like to do that in August now, so that is not for the next okay. agenda anymore. I believe we discussed doing a debrief on the presentation of the sustainability plan to the BOC. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. that's great. Uh, discussion of how to present the sustainability plan to the public post approval from the BOC. 
and uh, we can also do our timeline update as usual. Could we also um, have a debrief on this vulnerability meeting that's on the 10th? Sure, yes, we can do that, yeah. Because I think what we were presented with was, of course, incredibly interesting, but super duper important. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way in which we can, you know, blend what's happening here with that is really important. Yes, agreed. Um, I cannot guarantee if a consultant will be there, but I'm capable, happy yes, to do you that. Are. I'm happy to do that. So, and any ideas about um, how we can participate more in it? Um, I would say the if you are interested in getting more involved in the project, that next public meeting would be great, great thing to attend. The tenth, on the tenth, yes. yes, because that will be our final public outreach meeting for this project. Um, we have been working on an accelerated timeline. Um, our, off the top of my head, our kickoff was just back in January, and here we are concluding at the end of the summer. So um, the project timeline was all in all less than about eight months. So it was kind of a quick time frame, and so that will be the last public outreach meeting. The other thing... Um, I think that it was mentioned last time that you weren't here. Remember at the final knowledge and nibbles, people were making a lot of recommendations about things that could get done, and I believe you wrote them down. Um, I was not actively taking notes at the knowledge and nibbles. <laughs> I thought you were. Uh, I was not. I was uh, kind of helping manage the room, but uh, I do have in mind what some of those recommendations were. Because that them would be really stored in my mind. Good <laughs> too, if we could have those, because lots of people were making recommendations that were really interesting. The one you presented at. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm more familiar with those. Yes. The one you presented, and people were saying well, we could do this or we could do that. And they seem to be things that, as a committee, we should yeah. pay attention to. Yeah, I can write a list of those mm -hmm. suggestions, and we can discuss, and you all can let me know if I missed anything, too, that you remember. You know, it wasn't anywhere on this agenda, but I'm really curious about what has happened with the newsletter. Oh. Um, so we have finished the newsletter. It's just getting the departmental approval, and it should go out next week. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. It looks great. Can that be, be emailed happy. to us? Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. Was that all the items for next agenda? Yes. Okay. Could I ask a question about recycling? So... In recycling, all of those flyers and things we get in the mail that are shiny, that those can't be recycled, can they? I'm hoping to go sometime um, next month to the center, you know, just to see the reality of what happens there, you know, in the recycle center. So hopefully I'll get an answer because I don't know what about that either wrapping paper you know I know you can't oh, put uh, foil paper and but coated papers there's are questionable too you aren't so. supposed to I put them in anyway but but it would I mean as something that public awareness to all of these people who send them out because they think that they're like catch people's attention right the glossy paper if they could not do that, then we could recycle all of that. Um, that would be a, a good thing to think about because I'm sure the city uses those things for announcements. I mean, Tarpon Arts does because they think it 
look special. It does. But it, it doesn't but have it doesn't, to. Um, yeah, you, you're right. You can use heavier, non-glossy paper and make it look really good. So question for point. the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm, I'm hoping point. to get some insight into that by making a visit to the facility. I don't know. I looked it up a couple of times and, during COVID, and it, they mm -hmm. had not had tours going, but they mm -hmm. are resuming those again, so hoping to go. Well, I'd go with you. Is that permitted? <laughs> I know I have several oh. people that want to go. But, um. Yeah, I, if it's an item that could come back it for discussion. Will. Okay, we can't yeah. go. <laughs> then go cannot. separately. <laughs> Staff comments? Anything from you and Alex, Robin? <clears throat> I was just going to give updates about uh, when the presentation to the BOC will be, mm -hmm. which uh, I will also follow up in an email. So it will definitely be on that evening of June 27th. Um, some more information to come. And also when the public workshop for the vulnerability assessment would be, uh, which is July 10th at 6 p.m. And I was also going to give an update on the newsletter and website, which is something you all have been long awaiting. <laughs> Newsletter is going out next week. Website should be updated next week. So it's going to be a pretty thorough update, actually. Great. It's turned out to be, so. Great. Yeah. Excellent. Do you have anything, Alex? I do not. Just happy to be involved and can't wait to see how everything, you know, plays out. So pretty good timing for my internship, I'd say. <laughs> Are you... Are, is your position here going to be over? Or are you getting a job here? What is, no, no, no. Status? So my status is still currently same intern that I always was here. Um, I don't have plans to stay on. Um, so I'm pretty sure I think um, I'll be here throughout July. Um, but I am actively looking for a job. Um, so as soon as I get a job, then I'll see where that goes. Could be here, could be another state, who knows, but working on that right now. Mm. We'll miss you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Are you going to be at the um, BOC presentation? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to try and make it. I think uh, I'll, I'd like to see what actually happens there yeah. with all the higher ups and stuff. So We all look forward to that, yes. <laughs> Are there any um, committee comments? I have a couple comments. Okay. So, um, I would like to thank whoever put the crosswalk with the blinky lights in at Canal and Reed in spring. Um, when we did that uh, mapping exercise with Car Carolyn, is that her name? Okay. Caroline. When we, and, yeah, and we had that, that map and we had to put stuff in. Like my very big, 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 big comment was we have the sidewalk leading to nowhere and people mm -hmm. try to cross that and it's disastrously, mm -hmm. like such a disastrous yeah. um, intersection so um whoever's listening i'm i'm gonna go with it was my comments that said that's my number one priority is right there because i've seen so many things happen there um i'm just gonna go with that because that'll make me feel a lot better that it was my input that made that happen um and then um just trying to stay in line with with the agenda to make my comments at the end um can you um please tell me how many public outreach meetings there were for the vulnerable assessment plan uh, so in total after the next one it will be two 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 total and then um, how how is this next one being advertised to the community like what methods are being used so we're gonna start pushing it out next week uh, we'll do the social media uh, we will update our connect tarpon page we'll put flyers out we'll try to get it and uh, we'll have it in our newsletter and we'll try to get it in some other um, newsletters if possible um, we'll reach out to other departments and see if they can help push it out and get it in city facilities uh, we'll probably do a press release like we did for the previous one as well um, but also open to suggestions if you think mm -hmm. of something. I, I would wonder um, if it would not be 
worthwhile. I don't know how many people read it, but if there's anything that can go in the beacon that explains exactly kind of mm -hmm. what it is or what the purpose of it mm -hmm. is, um, the vulnerability assessment plan in general, but then also inviting the public to come because kind of if you don't if you don't know the big picture and mm -hmm. why the outreach uh, meeting is taking place, a lot of people don't feel compelled to go. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like, we want your input. And it's like, on what? The mm -hmm. vulnerability of the city. What type of vulnerability? Like, so I think, I don't know, would it be worth trying to reach out and, and just suggesting that, you know, the city's working on this plan or something? Just a suggestion. I mean, I don't know who has to approve something like that, but maybe just that there was more knowledge and education that this was actually happening, with, happening within the city and the community should be involved. Because it impacts every one of us, I think. That's a great idea. Yeah, I think Putting it would it be, beacon, yeah, good. be good to mm -hmm. know what the lead time, um, what their mandatory lead time is for public service announcements. Because this is really a public service announcement. It's but I think it could be incorporated for, yeah. into a little article that, that just explains be, that vulnerability yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how, how, like, how, not maybe not just, you know, how, that yes, Tarpon is vulnerable, but clearly it's, Florida, I mean, okay, let's go, it's global, but you know, how, how and then Tarpon Springs would like your input, so come, come to the meeting, learn more about it, and then help, help us, solve, help be a part of the community that solves this problem, or <laughs> mitigates the problem. Um, and then my last one is um, on the recycling. Mm -hmm. So I'll try to get the person's name, and I don't know if it would be beneficial to the committee. There is a woman who came and spoke to another group that I'm, with, I'm involved with on recycling from Pinellas County Waste Management. Mm -hmm. um, and it was completely all on what happens with your recycling, what you can and cannot recycle, why you cannot recycle little bottle caps because they get stuck wow. into the system and right. why, you know, et cetera. So it might, if, mm. if the committee is interested, might be worth reaching out. Um, I can get a name of the person who came out. I'll try to remember. I can't think of her name off the back of my head. You can let Robin know yeah. and she can distribute the information. That would be sure. excellent. And then I will say that the waste management down in, um, my kids would be very proud. I've done two field trips which, with each of them several, several years ago. And it was one of my favorite ones was to go to that waste management plant. plant. Hmm. And they do a very great job. Is it the incineration yeah, it's plant? Yeah, well, it's down on, off of 49th. It's down yeah, on 49th Street. Yeah, I did that Street. tour. But that's yeah. not the recycle. No, but facility. they do have um, somebody from that center who will give you education on mm -hmm. the recycling as well. I don't know about the recycling um, tour, yeah. but if anybody has an interest, I'll try to get her name, and um, she had a lot of great information. Thank you. You're welcome. I think that having that person come and present to this committee would be really a great idea. Okay. Yeah, I'll see if I can't get the information out to Robin. Then. I like be, that. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. And then how to make once how to make that information available to the, the wider public. public. Mm -hmm. They did uh, at one point, and I think it was in our um, water bill. I thought they said something at one point that showed what could and could not be recycled. Yeah, they do. They do they send do. out those. Yeah. Uh, but still, blonde. it's unclear even when you read sure. it. Right. Sure. Sure. Agreed. That's all I have. So, Thanks. do we have any more comments um, here? Uh -uh. Do we have a motion to adjourn this meeting? I make a motion to re <laughs> adjourn at 7.35 p.m. Yeah. All motion. in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.